On this week's episode of Cold Boot, we're covering a story from EVGA that enthusiasts have been wanting for years. Also, it appears some gamers with certain hardware will be receiving a free performance upgrade. Lastly, we're going to take a look at some emerging monitor technology and a new vulnerability that's affecting Windows. Let's hit that power button. It's time to Cold Boot. Welcome back. It's Poe back again with Let's Get Techie. On the first partition of today's episode, we have some news from EVGA that enthusiasts and extreme overclockers are hyped for. They finally formed a partnership with AMD and are currently working on two AM4 motherboards. EVGA has long been a loyal NVIDIA and Intel partner since, well, forever. EVGA has never strayed to AMD in the graphics department and likely never will. But it was just announced, however, they're working on an AM4 motherboard for AMD Ryzen CPUs. And according to an exclusive report from Steve at Gamers Nexus, EVGA is actually working on two boards and has been for roughly a year now. The first board, and the most exciting, will be in the EVGA Dark family of boards. These boards are purpose-built for overclocking. We're not talking about taking your 8700K to an all-core 5 gigahertz here. We're talking liquid nitrogen and liquid helium breaking world records overclocking. The second will be a toned down board when compared to the Dark, but still very capable. This will likely fall under their For the Win branding. The Dark family of boards have been staples when it comes to overclocking Intel chips over the last few years. Kingpin, the worldwide known overclocker, works with EVGA on development of these boards as well as his Kingpin line of graphics cards, also built by EVGA and also meant for balls to the wall overclocking. This is undoubtedly exciting news for EVGA fans as AMD Ryzen CPUs have flip-flop spots with Intel and are now what most enthusiasts are going towards due to higher IPC, better multi-threading, and now even better single core and gaming performance. But you have to ask, is this the right time for EVGA to jump in on the AMD bandwagon and start building boards? I mean, the new AM5 socket is set to release about a year from now, so why enter the AM4 game so late? Is this a mistake? Not necessarily, and I'll tell you three reasons why. It may seem odd that EVGA is just now beginning to talk about selling a board that likely won't be out for a few months when Ryzen 5000 has been on the market for over eight months. But being on the market and being in the hands of consumers are two totally different things. Due to the global chip shortage we've faced over the last year, many people who want to upgrade have not yet been able to snag a Ryzen 5000 CPU, and so the market for this board being used with Ryzen 5000 has not yet fully been satisfied. It's also worth noting that at Computex this year, AMD announced their new 3D vCache technology for upcoming Ryzen CPUs. Check our previous video on AMD's Computex keynote for more on that. Lisa Su also stated that this new technology would first be coming in the form of a Ryzen 5000 refresh that will likely hit the market in Q1 of 2022. There's the second set of buyers for EVGA's new motherboard. Lastly, you have to remember who these boards are targeted towards, especially the dark. It's meant for extreme overclockers. Those are the folks that don't care about when a socket is going end of life and just want anything and everything they can get that could possibly give them an advantage in the leaderboards. That's a total of three different sets of buyers that could possibly be interested in these new boards from EVGA. I told myself when Lisa Sue said they were doing a 3D vCache version of Ryzen 5000 that I wasn't going to buy it and that I would just wait for Zen 4 and AM5 to upgrade since I already have a Ryzen 5600X. But then EVGA had to come along and do this and now I'm rationalizing making not only a new motherboard purchase but a new CPU purchase to go with it. This is why it's not only good for EVGA, but also good for AMD. You have smucks like me that just seem to love throwing money away. On the second partition of today's episode, we're taking a look at some free performance some gamers are about to receive. If you own an Acer laptop equipped with an RTX 30 series card, get ready for Christmas in July because Acer is about to release firmware updates that will increase the power limit of the NVIDIA GPU inside your laptop. Apparently, after seeing reviews of how their laptops stack up to the competition, Acer has decided they want to push the envelope a bit further. We aren't talking massive power increases here, anywhere from 5 to 30 watts, but minor increases are to be expected in this situation because since these laptops have already shipped, that means Acer can't go back and swap out things like power delivery components on the logic board, and you can bet they don't want to push power levels to a point where their supplied wall adapter is no longer sufficient to fully power the device under load. Either way, any free performance is always welcome. 
The new firmware is available now on Acer's website. If you own a Nitro 5, Helios 300, or Triton 300 model, head over there and pick up your free performance. You're welcome. On the third partition of today's cold boot, we're taking a look at some interesting monitor technology from a company that you've probably never heard of unless you happen to live in Japan. Greenhouse Gaming has announced a new monitor that will use a panel based on IGZO backlight technology. IGZO stands for Indium Gallium Zinc Oxide. We're just going to call it IGZO. According to Tom's Hardware, IGZO was originally developed by Samsung and Sharp. This technology allows for lower power consumption, faster electron mobility, better panel transparency, and smaller transistor size. This means you're going to use less electricity, have a brighter overall panel for a given power level, and theoretically have faster response times. Unfortunately, this particular model, the really large horrible name I'm not reciting, doesn't support the ever popular DCI P3 color space, but it does support 99.9% .9 sRGB and 96% Adobe RGB coverage. You're getting a 1440p panel with 165 hertz refresh and a 2 millisecond gray to gray response time and adaptive sync, of course. For the input connectivity, you'll get one display port and three HDMI ports. No word yet on pricing, but it's expected to come to market next month. Let us know down in the comments whether or not you'd be willing to be an early adopter of something like this. I think it's fair to say that people in the North American market, having never heard of greenhouse gaming, might steer clear of this one. But if this were in an LG or Asus monitor, would you be willing to shell out the cash for this new tech? Drop a comment below. On the last partition of today's episode, we're looking at yet another vulnerability impacting Windows. This one, as of the time of writing this script, is still unpatched. This new vulnerability is known as Print Nightmare, and no, it doesn't force you to set up USB printers for hours on end, even though that's what you would expect by the name. Print Nightmare is a zero-day vulnerability that affects all versions of Windows, but according to The Verge, it's not yet clear if it only pertains to server versions or includes consumer versions as well. This vulnerability allows attackers to remotely execute code with system level privileges. This means it basically gives them free reign to do whatever they please with all files, programs, and accounts using full admin rights. Print Nightmare was originally discovered by researchers who apparently had some miscommunication with Microsoft and thought they had already pushed a patch, which of course they had not. Researchers then published the exploit, and at that moment I'm sure at least a few people at Microsoft stroked out. At the time of writing this script, Microsoft has begun working on a patch for this exploit, but in the meantime suggests disabling Windows Print Spooler service if possible, or disabling inbound remote printing through group policy. Let us know down in the comments if you work in the business environment and are currently having to deal with this fiasco. Unfortunately, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Cold Boot. If you enjoyed this week's video, exploit that like button and consider subscribing if you aren't already. Also, don't forget to click the bell icon so you get notified when our next video goes live. We appreciate you watching, and we will see you in the next one.